Welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Sylvain Lézé from the Department of Aeronautics at Imperial College London, and this is a new episode of the podcast Turbulence at the Exascale. If you're not familiar with the podcast, we are trying to gather the view of the, the uh, turbulence community regarding uh, exascale computing for turbulent flows and trying to identify uh, challenges and opportunity that will come with uh, the next generation of, of supercomputers. So this uh, podcast is part of uh, a UK initiative called uh, Excalibur, uh, which is led by the Met Office, the UK Atomic Energy Authority and the UK Research and Innovation. And its aim is to deliver uh, innovative algorithm developments to harness the power of, uh, of supercomputing and um, exascale computers in, in particular. This podcast is also uh, strongly linked with the UK Turbulence uh, Consortium. And uh, you can find all the information about the podcast on the UK Turbulence uh, Consortium website. It's just UK Turbulence on Google. You will find it very easily. Uh, today we have a guest from, from outside the UK. Uh, our guest is uh, Wim Munters, who is a research engineer at the Von Kamen Institute for Fluid uh, Dynamics in uh, Belgium. And uh, Wim uh, has a lot of interest in, uh, in CFD, of course, uh, uh, in particular around uh, turbulent resolving flow simulations and um, uh, wind energy applications. So good afternoon, Wim. Thank you. Thank you, Sylvain. Thanks for inviting me uh, on this podcast. Uh, my pleasure. Um, so we are going to, to uh, uh, start with the first question. So for those who don't know you, please, can you uh, tell us a little bit more about yourself, where you're from, what you have studied, and how did you end up uh, at the Von Kármán Institute for Fluid Dynamics? Yeah, yes, of course. Um, so yes, I'm, I'm Wim Munters. I was, um, I'm uh, Belgian. Um, so I'm uh, from Flanders. That's the, the, the Dutch speaking region of Belgium. Um, and um, at the beginning of my, my, my studies, I did what I think a lot of engineering students or students interested in engineering will do. They go to the largest uh, university in Flanders, which is um, the KU Leuven. Um, where I started the program on uh, mechanical engineering. At that time, I think I was quite, uh, had a broad interest in uh, science, uh, engineering, uh, mathematics, um, but I got quite inspired by, by fluid dynamics uh, during my studies, uh, also in part due to my uh, advisor for my final project at the time, Johan Meers. Um, so I decided to, to uh, pursue a PhD also in mechanical engineering in his group. Um, on uh, optimization and optimal control of wind farms. And during my PhD, I also uh, had the opportunity to, um, to uh, work, collaborate um, with uh, uh, Charles Manevo and visit his uh, turbulence research group at uh, Johns Hopkins University in the United States. Um, after finishing my PhD, I did a short postdoc uh, at KU Leuven, also on wind farm control. Um, and then I took a bit of a, a, a shift. So I went to the Netherlands, uh, the Eindhoven University of uh, Technology, where I took up a, a lecturing position. So doing a lot of teaching in the Department of uh, Applied Mathematics, um, where I was teaching a lot of stuff on uh, scientific computing, applied maths, uh, but also applied to, uh, to fluid dynamics and, and starting up some small scale research projects there. Um, and then uh, relatively recently, I um, made another move again to uh, the Von Karman Institute or the VKI, as we call it, uh, where I am now a research engineer in the environmental and applied fluid dynamics uh, department. Great. Thank you. So when did you join uh, the VKI? Um, yeah, so that's uh, relatively recently. So I think now I've been working there for uh, about half a year. So it was just after uh, last summer that I uh, made the move. Did you have the opportunity to go in the institute physically or? Yes, so fortunately uh, at that time, I think uh, there was, the situation was a bit uh, improved um, and I did have some opportunity to, to, to work on site already, which I think, yeah, switching jobs uh, in the current uh, pandemic situation is quite um, yeah, interesting, I'd say, um, but uh, that worked out very well. Great. And so my, my next question is, um, obviously, you're fairly new to the VKI, but uh, um, what's, what do you like about working um, for the VKI at the moment? 
Yeah, so indeed, I've, I'm, I'm quite uh, recent at, at VKI, but what I really like there is um, that there is really a lot of parallel um, research going on, both experimentally and numerically in all uh, facets of uh, fluid dynamics. Um, there's a very nice uh, working atmosphere with very good colleagues. Um, I, I, I also really enjoy being uh, active in, in, in uh, research on, on energy. I think it's a very nice uh, and positive area to do research in. But um, another thing I really like is that you get to work with um, a lot of highly motivated and skilled students in a very international environment. And that we're actually able to engage these students in, in, in really ongoing uh, research projects. So I think that's also a very big uh, plus of my position. Great. Um, so a follow-up question on that. Of course, the the, the von Kármán Institute for Fluid Dynamics is a, a unique um, uh, institute in the world. So for those who may not be very familiar with it, um, can you tell us a little bit more how how it is structured, how it's working, and um, mm -hmm. yeah, that would be yes, good. Of course, of course. Um, so the von Kármán Institute. Um, now is existing for uh, 65 years. So we're celebrating the 65th anniversary this year. Um, and indeed in the uh, 1950s, uh, Theodor von Karman, uh, very well known, um, was the uh, chairman of the aeronautical R&D uh, advisory group for NATO. And he uh, proposed uh, to establish uh, an institute devoted to uh, training and uh, research for young engineers of NATO uh, nations. And at that time, it was uh, the VKI was called the Training Center for Experimental Aerodynamics. Uh, and after um, von Karman's death, it was then renamed uh, as the von Karman Institute. And today we're a um, nonprofit uh, educational and scientific organization hosting three departments. Um, we have an aeronautics and aerospace uh, division. There's a division on turbo machinery and propulsion. And then there's a final division, which I'm a part of, which is uh, on environmental and applied uh, fluid dynamics. And we are funded by um, 15 NATO countries and about we have about 100 um, uh, permanent employees. Now at VKI, we have, let's say, a historical competence in uh, experimental and high-speed aerodynamics. Uh, but over the last uh, 65 years, that has really broadened to, to, to a wider scope. Um, where nowadays I think the main focus is on uh, using fluid dynamics for a, a cleaner world, let's say, um, with applications spanning a lot of different flow regimes from, um, from uh, space debris and, and re-entry uh, type of uh, regimes to a recent strong focus also on, uh, on renewable energy technologies, um, on efficient, uh, efficient propulsion, efficient gas turbines, green hydrogen, offshore wind energy. Um, so I think that also translates a bit in uh, the, the facilities at VKI. So historically, we have a lot of experimental and world unique um, facilities, uh, wind tunnels ranging from very big, low subsonic uh, tunnels to uh, Mach 15, Mach 20 uh, wind tunnels. Um, but also recently, we start looking more and more into the computational side of things. Um, where we're really interested in high fidelity simulations uh, on very parallel architectures, of course. Great, thank you. And just quick uh, question out of curiosity, what um, uh, resources do you have in terms of um, supercomputing? Mm -hmm. um, so we, uh, we use different levels of supercomputing. So we have an in-house uh, cluster on which, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's not very big, but um, it hosts, um, I think the recent uh, AMD Epic uh, Rome uh, processors, mm -hmm. which work very well for us. Um, but also we are working with clusters at the, at the regional, so the Flemish uh, and, the, and the Walloon levels, uh, but also on the European clusters uh, for, for bigger jobs. Great, um, fantastic. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about on what projects you are working on um, at the moment? I know once again, everything is fairly new to you, but would be interesting to hear about um, mm -hmm. your research. Yeah, so um, my, my current research is focused mostly on um, multi-scale uh, wind and weather simulation for, for wind energy applications. And then uh, I specifically focus mostly on the, on the micro-scale, high-fidelity, uh, large eddy simulation part of that. Um, because 
recently we see uh, in Belgium, but also I think throughout Europe, um, an increased industry interest in, uh, in wind farm LES with high fidelity simulations. And I believe that today we really start um, getting the computational resources available to make this uh, to make this into a reality, and and that that not only means doing these simulations on, say, the largest machines that are out there, but even on our in-house cluster, we're able to relatively comfortably uh, run um, realistic large eddy simulation cases of of wind farm setups. And uh, yeah, so specifically, some projects that we're looking in is, uh, for example a uh, better understanding or prediction of uh, extreme weather events um, with a lot of turbulent loading of the turbines, um, including large eddy simulations, or a better understanding of uh, microphysics or rainfall and the correlation with, with lightning, because that has severe implications of, uh, for leading edge erosion of turbines, uh, which allows you then to optimize uh, inspection, uh, monitoring, and maintenance. Um, but also uh, leveraging the, these multi-scale simulation tools uh, for operational optimization and control of wind farms in order to support electricity grids to maximize uh, power extraction in such farms. Um, another aspect that I'm looking into a bit is uh, hybrid simulations. Um, so combining, let's say, uh, RANS type simulations with scale resolved uh, simulations like LES, uh, because this also allows us to do to bring more higher fidelity to industrially relevant flows. Great. And uh, I, I'm curious to know about the what tools do you have at your disposal? And um, I'm talking about flow solvers and uh, all these things. Um, what, what are you using for those uh, simulations? Yeah. Um, so I think the, the tools that I've been using have uh, varied a bit over, over the years. Um, I was, uh, let's say, brought up uh, during my PhD in a very high order type of school uh, where we use these uh, high order Fourier pseudospectral uh, large eddy simulation solvers combined with um, yeah, quasi-Newton uh, optimizers uh, where we spent a lot of effort in optimizing those things uh, for our application. Uh, currently at VKI, we are not fully developing our own uh, dedicated flow solver. We're more extending uh, existing community codes, uh, but we're trying to diversify that a bit. So for our, um, let's say, weather multi-scale type of simulations, we're uh, using uh, the weather research and forecasting uh, tools. So that's the WRF from uh, NCAR in the US. Um, including also its, its LES uh, counterpart, so WARF LES, um, because that's very capable for, for all kinds of weather mm -hmm. modeling. Uh, but we're also using more uh, higher order and more uh, specialized tools like NEC 5000, um, because it's, yeah, there are some very interesting developments there also um, for wind energy applications, but also for exascale type of computing. Um, and then maybe for, let's say, a bit more uh, run-of-the-mill uh, applications, we're also using a lot of open foam. Great. Fantastic. Um, now, uh, let's talk a little bit more about um, exascale computing. So based on your uh, extensive experience in, in simulating turbulent flows, um, what do you think is the best strategy or the best approach um, if we were to, to do the, the large eddy simulation that you are doing, um, but using very large uh, supercomputers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, there again, um, if I had a one clear answer, um, that would be nice, but I, I think it's not that simple. Um, I, I do believe that it's a bit of a trade off between highly specialized codes um, that are very tailored to a specific application and then somewhat more broad application type of codes. Uh, so I think still for very simple geometries, very simple setups, um, things like these pseudo spectral uh, Fourier type um, LES solvers are still rel very popular. Um, then comes again the question, well, will these keep on scaling when we start porting them to more parallel and more parallel uh, architectures? And I'm a bit worried about that because they're also quite inflexible. Um, on the other hand, yeah, NEC 5000, I think, does have this uh, capability um, while still being high order. Um, but on the other hand, if you have to add um, non-smooth type of solutions, very complex uh, geometries, 
then um, I think you have to use whatever is available. So I'm a big I order fan, but sometimes uh, you just have to use what works, I think. Um, also for the future, I think um, the current tools, um, well, we may want to rethink some of the approaches in those tools, uh, whether we should always go for higher order or lower order, compressible or incompressible, um, or different kind of discretization techniques. I think a lot of those things might change based on the hardware that you're targeting. Um, so it's a bit of a mixed answer. I'm, I'm sorry about that. But no, uh, no, no, it's it's very interesting. I, I have an, a slightly different question. Um, I mean, you have been doing LES for quite some time now, especially for uh, uh, wind energy application. Now, I was wondering if, if you think there's uh, still room for a new large dissimulation models or if you think that um, the, the, the LES model that we have at the moment are absolutely um, fine for um, what you're doing. Um, and with, with model, you mean the, the subgrid scale model? Or yes, the... yes, 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 yes. Yeah, um, I, that's again, I think a bit of a hard question. I, my view on that has always been a little bit that you should make sure that your LES is fine enough such that you do not um, rely too much on the model um, I think there are some very uh, nice models, uh, dynamic uh, Lagrangian models out there. I've been mostly using relatively simple um, subgrid scale models, uh, Smagorinsky type uh, with some wall damping. I'm not too sure about that, whether that's the actual uh, direction that we should be going. Um, that depends a bit also on what kind of resolutions we'll be, uh, we'll be running on in the future. I think if we're at roughly a 10 meter resolution, then the, the subgrid scale models have lesser influence than mm -hmm. what in atmospheric communities is already maybe fine as 50 meter resolution. And then um, I think that's a different story. Uh, so I think there's cer certainly some, some room for improvement there, but I'm not sure that is the exact direction that we should be going in. Great. No, I was just uh, curious um, because as you said, uh, at the end of the day, most of the people are using the, the, the very sim yeah. simplify Smagorinsky model with the world damping function. So uh, I was just curious. Um, uh, my next question is, um, if tomorrow um, you get access to a big supercomputers, uh, an exascale computers, and if you are able to use it, um, I mean, so let's not talk about all the issues uh, related to that, but what will you be able to do with an exascale computer that you cannot do at the moment? Um, yeah, that, that's, uh, that's a very good question. Um, so I think having these uh, architectures available allows us to, uh, let's say, excel in, in, in different kinds of areas. Um, so I think we would be able to do uh, more of what we're currently doing. Uh, so in that sense, that means that where uh, currently we have the resources to, to run a certain amount of LESs for a given configuration. Maybe we can do 10 times or 100 times that in the future. And that's something that would be relatively easy because that would scale well. And that could be used in uncertainty quantification uh, because that's something that industry is very, um, very interested in or in uh, ensembles for forecasting. Now, in terms of uh, more, that, that's easy, but we'd also be very much interested in faster and bigger. Um, so for faster, I think, let's say if we, if we were able to run these wind farm control uh, optimization algorithms much faster than we can run them now, where they now take uh, weeks to months, whether maybe we can start using those things in, in real time. And then that's, I mean, it's very challenging whether that will actually work, but um, yeah, let, let's assume that it that it would. I think that's a very high impact uh, application that we could do. Now, in terms of uh, bigger simulations, um, yeah, we see that the uh, mesoscale models get more and more fine. We see that the LES domains get bigger and bigger and bigger. So I think a nice case there would be to do uh, an LES of the North Sea uh, region. Um, I mean, that's for a lot of people considered to be the uh, power plant of, of the future for Europe. Um, so I think that would be a very nice simulation to do. Good. Um, so I've, you, you mentioned uh, control uh, in your answer. So um, I've noticed that um, you have been doing some, some work, uh, I guess, a few years ago about uh, data-driven mm -hmm. uh, uh, control. Uh, can you maybe 
tell us a little bit about this uh, type of control? Yes, yes, certainly. Um, so yeah, the work I've been doing on uh, control, it's a bit uh, dual. So there was a lot of physics based and uh, yeah, based on optimization of, of PDEs, of large eddy simulations, which is very computationally intensive and gives you very, very complex uh, control signals that interact with the turbulence in very intricate ways. Um, but those things are not feasible in practice. They take far too long uh, to compute. Um, so, and that, that's one of the things that will come with, uh, with exascale computing. We get a huge amount of data, uh, but we also want to learn from this data. And I think the data-driven tools that we see that are really gaining a lot of traction now, I think they're very instrumental there. So what we did there is we tried to, let's say, learn or yeah, learn the, um, the most important dynamics in, in, such, a, in such a controlled uh, setting, obtain, obtaining uh, data from high fidelity simulation models and try to distill that into very tractable and, and much more lower dimensional models. And that's based, for example, on uh, proper orthogonal decomposition and, and dynamic mode decomposition. Now that works in some cases, um, but yeah, here um, the turbulence makes it very challenging because uh, doing um, order reduction with with turbulent flows when your when the data that you have is already quite at a marginal resolution that uh, that proved to be very very challenging. Um, but yeah, we got some some nice results out of that. Um, so yeah, I think. Um, I think it's a very promising area of research, uh, the data-driven um, data driven tools. And I think they go hand in hand with, uh, with exascale and large-scale uh, physics-based modeling. Great, good, thank you very much. Um, 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 a few more uh, general questions. So, so uh, is, I, I'm always asking these, these silly questions, but uh, if there is one thing about HPC that you could change to, to, to better fit your, your needs or uh, to make sure that your, your flow solvers are running, I don't know, faster or you can scale better, uh, what would that be? What are the, the issues that you have at the moment and how, how will you get around that? Mm -hmm. um... So yeah, there's a, there's a lot of things on the wish list, I'd say, um, and it's always nice uh, to have these small incremental changes when you have a new uh, a new chipset that's coming out and, and and it goes maybe 10, 15 percent faster. But one of the things that I really like to have is um, the uh, the capability of doing some kind of hardware agnostic uh, programming that you. Um, that you write your code, that all of the optimization for the for the hardware level that that's that that's fully automated because that's in my uh, view that's one of the main challenges that we're seeing uh, now already, and that will be even more important in the future I think. Uh, so, in that sense, uh, I'm afraid that uh, at some point um, you need to be in order to to run these uh, simulations effectively. You need to. Uh, be both a physicist and a mathematician and a computer mm -hmm. scientist. And um, it would be good if at least some of those levels could be uh, made, uh, let's say, as a black box for the application scientists. Uh, I think that's very important for the future. Good. I couldn't agree more on that. Um, and an another question, I mean, based on your, your experience, um, do, do you think the the turbulence community and well in your case the the the, the wind energy community is ready for uh, the the next generation of, of of supercomputers or do you think that uh, at some point we are going to get stuck that that's also a very good question um, and I think uh, again my answer will be very double um, so I think some people are have been thinking about this for a really long time already, uh, and they are very ready. Um, if I look at uh, groups like uh, at the National Renewable Energy Lab, uh, where they're developing these uh, dedicated exascale tools uh, in their ExaWind project, um, then that looks all very, very promising. Um, also on other community codes like uh, NEC 5000, there's really a lot of very interesting developments, uh, especially from uh, KTH with uh, accelerators, mm -hmm. uh, adaptive mesh refinement. So I think a lot of people are thinking about it uh, in very uh, great detail. Um, 
on the other hand, um, I'm a bit uh, worried about about some other things that, um, yeah, um, I, I think application scientists um, should be, uh, let's say, a bit more HPC aware. Uh, so in terms of education, um, that, that there's a lot of investments that or a lot of low hanging fruit uh, that could be uh, that could be, uh, let's say, uh, harvested by, by uh, let's say, a more detailed education in, in how to use these machines in a, in a very efficient way. Um, and also the fact that good software engineering practices are quite often not the prime goals in the most research groups. And uh, I think that's very dangerous for the future because if everyone keeps... Um, developing their own in-house uh, research codes, those things will very likely not work well uh, with future architectures. Uh, that's a bit one of my concerns, I'd say. Great, thank you very much. And um, I have one last question. So I guess you are at the start of your, uh, of your career, which means you are going to be using uh, supercomputers for uh, many years to come. And uh, I, I'm curious to, to know if you have any, uh, uh, idea or anticipation of, of what what will happen in 10 15 uh, 20 25 years um, after the the, the, the exascale computing era uh, do you think we are going to see a revolution with completely brand new hardware or do you think we are still going to have you know gpus that are uh, faster and more energy efficient and cpus with more core and and things like this what's your view on that yeah, so um, I wish I wish I knew, um, but so yeah, the fact that we're currently slowly seeing our MPI codes are going a bit out of style uh, in favor of uh, GPU-based codes. Um, yeah, that that means that now we have to take significant investments in 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 making these kind of codes, uh, making them work properly on 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 the hardware of. In a, of a couple of years in the future, but whether we will be able to uh, to uh, recuperate those investments for for a longer period of time, I think that's a very hard question, um, and that is also uh, that that doesn't only depend on on us. Uh, I think a lot of developments there um, are driven by other industries. I think uh, the GPU revolution is also uh, driven by by other industries. So I think that's um, one thing to certainly keep an eye on. Um, another kind of elephant in the room, I think, is uh, quantum computing, um, which currently still feels like it's very far away. But with recent um, recent developments and achievements in quantum computing, I'm I'm not so sure anymore that that. Uh, I mean, if you would have asked me uh, at the start of my PhD or uh, some time ago whether I would still see quantum computing for for turbulent flow simulations, I probably would have said no. Now I might say maybe. So, um, and that all depends on whether we will be able to harness uh, this kind of computing uh, for, for solving PDEs. Uh, that, that's still a very big open question, I think. Great. Well, thank you very much, uh, Wim, for your time and for your input. It was very nice uh, chatting with you. And uh, we would like to wish you, of course, all the best for your uh, future endeavors and uh, hopefully you will be able to enjoy the Von Karman Institute in person uh, very soon. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, for listening to this podcast. Uh, as usual, you can find all the links um, on the UK Turbulence Consortium website and on the Twitter account, UK Turbulence uh, in One World. Uh, thank you very much, all, and hopefully see you soon for uh, a new episode.